Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshiped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. All of this, Job did not sin charge God with any wrong doing the words of our Lord Jesus Christ I am the resurrection and the life whoever believes in me though he or she dies yet shall he or she live everyone who lives and believe in me shall never die do you believe this the word of God for the people of God on this day can we give God a mighty hand clap of praise celebrating the life of Margaret Elizabeth Boone A believer who has gone on to be with the Lord. We know that the word of God declares that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We thank God for the life that she lived, place her faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are here today to pay our final earthly respects, celebrating the life that began November the 2nd, 1937, folded her tent February the 28th, 2024. To God be the glory for a life well lived. This time, uh, we bless with the congregational hymn at this time, followed by a scripture reading. Old Testament, LaRonda Boone, New Testament, Francine Boone, and then we'll have our prayer of comfort by Reverend Rochella at that time. We're grateful today for this wonderful funeral home who is leading us, assisting us to make sure that everything is done in excellence. So our music ministry, will you begin leading us now? Amen. As we sing uplifted voices on today we came to have a great time in the lord
Amen. You may be seated in the very presence of God. To my right, to your left as well, we're asking those scripture readings to come. You may come at this time. Psalms 139. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light above me be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. From the New Testament, Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. Amen. To the family, my deepest sympathy and I just want to let you know that your mom and your dad was an intricate part of my spiritual journey. Your mother spoke wisdom in my life and encouragement as a Bible study teacher, and I will be always grateful for her. First Peter 5, 7 says, cast all of your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And please know God is close to the brokenhearted. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I stand here this morning asking for your peace and comfort for my dear sister, Sorod Margaret Boone's family, who is mourning her passing. In times like these, Heavenly Father, we look to you for our help and hope, which can only come from you. Father, I pray with all of my heart that you would meet her children grandchildren, and all of her family members at their very point of need. Please hold their hands and hearts and give them the blessed assurance that even though Sister Margaret is absent from her body, she's present with you, walking and talking again in heaven. Praise the Lord. Thank you. I pray you will bless their hearts wipe away their tears and embrace them with your love and promise that they are not alone. You will never leave them because you said in your word, Isaiah 43, 2, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. 
When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, and the flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, and I will never leave you or forsake you. Heavenly Father, please watch over Sister Margaret's family, her friends, and all those whose hearts are heavy today. Protect them. Watch over them. Let them feel your love, your peace, compassion, and comfort. In the name of Jesus, dear Father, I pray. Thank you, hallelujah, for the blessing of knowing Sister Margaret and the blessings that she instilled in so many of us. We are grateful for her life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Praise the Lord. As the scripture was read, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. I want to say that the family sees this as a celebration, a home going. Amen. So yes. today Dana said, we need to have a, a celebration of life. And that's what we've come to do this afternoon, well, morning. Amen. So we ask that you would just join us in singing praises to our God because there is a reason to celebrate. Amen. There is a reason to celebrate and give God thanks. Amen. So join us in. I just want to praise you. Let's all sing together. I just want to praise you forever.
thank you to our music ministry choir. Aren't they blessing us on today? Amen. What a wonderful, wonderful tribute it is. Sister Maria Purnell is coming for our acknowledgments at this time. And while she's coming, family, we want you to know that the Antioch Church is praying mightily for you. And whatever we can do for you in the upcoming days, weeks, and months, we want you to know that Deaconess Boone was very instrumental in so many ways in our church. And we want you to know that you're forever in our thoughts, our hearts, not only today, weeks to come. Whatever we can do for you, please let us know. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Good afternoon uh, to the Boone family. I have a few letters uh, that I would like to read. To the family of our beloved sister, Miss Margaret Boone, from Antioch Baptist Church, Friday morning Bible study. Dear Sister Margaret's family, on behalf of all members, past and present of Friday morning Bible study, we all extend to you our deepest sympathy for the passing of your mother and grandmother. There are simply no words that can truly express our profound sadness for your loss. Though our words can do little, we all pray and hope our thoughts and prayers will provide support and comfort to you at all at this time. Please know the members of the Friday morning Bible study all loved and adored our dear sister Margaret. For years before her illness, she was a devoted member of our Bible study, always providing encouragement, support, wisdom, and of course, a little humor to help us on our spiritual journey. Your mother and grandmother was an inspiration and model for how to live and walk out your faith according to the word of God. She taught us how to endure and trust our Heavenly Father with unwavering faith, regardless of your life situation. Her legacy of love, kindness, strength, perseverance, and courage will be part of our hearts forever. Again, we are so very sorry. May the peace of our Heavenly Father comfort you during this time. Yours in Christ, members of the Friday morning Bible study. Family and friends of Miss Margaret Boone, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Psalms 116, verse 15. While we extend our deepest sympathy to the family of Mrs. Margaret Boone, we join with you in celebrating her life. Our heartfelt prayers and condolences are truly yours today. We are sharing your sadness and praying the Lord's precious, precious promises will give you peace and strength for today and hope for tomorrow. To the Boone family, we lift up to the Lord. We lift you up to the Lord. Our prayer for you today is that God will lead and guide you through this very difficult time. May you be comforted by the promises of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit. For earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. God instructs us to comfort our hearts with his assurance that his life, that this life is not the end. Those who are in Christ have been granted eternal life. Your loved one has gone home to the waiting arms of our Savior. Although her absence is painful, we pray that God's grace will not only keep you, but lead you day by day. Your loved one's life is your legacy. Her love for you was her gift, and her precious memories will live on in your hearts forever. As you walk through this valley, your lovely Heavenly Father holds your hand, and Antioch Baptist Church holds you in our hearts and prayers. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16 Respectfully submitted on this 14th day of March by Rev. Dr. Kevin B. Taylor, Senior Pastor and the Antioch Baptist Church family. And may the words that I've read bring a comfort to the entire family. Thank you. The family has chosen to acknowledge four reflections. 
First one by Reverend Keith and Tracy Coleman. Second by Dana Boone. Third by Roger Boone. Fourth by Gary Brooks. If your name did not appear, that means you don't offer a reflection in this setting. But you can offer it at a later time, but not in this setting. Thank you. Let's follow the program as printed. Good afternoon, family. Good afternoon, Antioch. Good afternoon, Delta Sigma Theta. And good afternoon, all friends and loved ones of the great Margaret Boone. Now, my wife and I had this kind of worked out. We were going to tag team this thing, but uh, it's on me, amen. So uh, if, you hear, if she has to pull my coattail, then you understand I'm getting a little carried away, amen. But in the spirit of things, we just wanted to stand before you and let you know that God truly blessed us with the life of Margaret Boone and her husband, Brother Howard Boone. We were their surrogates, amen. All of the family know that we was hanging out whenever we could, amen. And they love to have us hang out, and we thank y'all for that. Thank y'all for allowing us to be a part of your family in that way. And uh, just so that you know that uh, there was so much that Margaret and Howard poured into me and Tracy that uh, I think if you hang around us a little while, you'll start to see them popping out here and there. But they poured into us, they loved us, uh, they gave us uh, inspiration to do the things that God is doing with us. And I just want to uh, say that when she went through what she went through at the end of her life, it was her opportunity to glorify God in a magnificent way. You won't see it for a while, but when you think about it, she was praising God all the way home. Amen. You could look into her eyes and you can see the spirit of God coming out of her eyes when she talked to you. And then when you start singing something about the word of God, she started to rock and sing a little bit with you. Amen. So, in my sanctified mind, I can see her now because we've, we've seen what she's been on this side of the sun and how she, she persevered and moved over to the other side. But what, what, what we don't think about is where she is now in the bosom of Abraham and where things are now because I can hear her saying, hey, babe, boy, where you at, Howard? Where you at, boy? getting ready to get my new wings and they're going to be special too because you know God gave me some tremendous stuff to do right before I left so mine going to be pretty special amen I think she knew that and I think we should know that as we move forward that a life well lived a race well run culminates in a mighty, mighty, glorious life on the other side. And when I see her, I'm going to check out all of that new that she spoke me. And I'm going to say, I just want to praise God for giving me the opportunity of knowing you the 29 years and knowing my wife the 29 years that you knew us. God bless your family. We're a phone call away. Anything that we can do, let us know. But keep on praising God because Sister Margaret and Brother Howard set it off. Amen.
Hopefully y'all can bear with me as I make my way through my words. Um, we are here to celebrate the life of Margaret Elizabeth Brooks Boone. Sometimes you don't realize the magnitude of someone's impact on your life until they are gone. I stand before you today to share a little bit about my mother and the impact that she had on my life. Margaret Boone was a wife, a, what, a mother, a sister, a grandmother, a great-grandmother, an aunt, a cousin, a friend. She was many different things to a lot of different people. But to me, she was not only my mother, she was my best friend. My mother had four children whom she loved with all of her heart. She had three boys, and then I came along, her only daughter. As I look back over her lifetime, I didn't realize how truly gifted my mother was. She was a natural born leader, and she instilled that in each of her children, the ability to lead. There were times throughout my life when I would look and I would think to myself, why can't this woman just sit still? She was always busy doing something, yet she always had time for her family, especially her children. My mom was an educator. She instilled in all of us the importance of education. She also made sure that all of her children went to college. It was just not an option. My mother loved to read. You would often find her during the summers with a good James Mishner book in her hand. I can remember her dragging me to the library every two weeks, requiring me to read something during the summer. If it wasn't a reading book in her hand, she often had a cookbook in her hand. She loved Southern, Southern Living cookbooks and would often be looking for new recipes for the next function she was going to host. She was truly the hostess with the mostess. From a young age, my mother put me in all kinds of things um, and it wasn't until later that I realized it was the things that she ever, either never learned how to do or was afraid to do. She did that for all of us. I know she often shared with me her love of sports and how she wished she could have played sports as a young girl. I guess that's why every time I looked up, she had enrolled me in every sport known to mankind. That was the thing about our mother. She provided each of us with opportunities to find our greatness. She encouraged and supported us wholeheartedly. You may be surprised to know that our competitive nature definitely came from our mother. She loved to play games as a family. She would not let any of us win. <laughs> if you beat her, you earned that win. I can remember the first time I finally beat her in Scrabble. It took me a long time to do it, but I finally did. But I enjoyed that time together. My love of football not only came from just watching my older brothers play, but often I would lay on the floor with my mom in the family room watching the games, and we would actually talk about our favorite quarterbacks. She loved John Elway, and we both liked Jim Plunkett back in the day. The memories I cherished most about my mom was the quality time that we spent together. From the early years of watching the soap operas together to staying up late in the summertime watching old black and white movies together. As we got older, our bond grew stronger. I looked forward to sitting up in her, in her room, painting our nails, um, and, and we had a lot of girl talk. I will miss the daily conversations where we would talk every day about anything and everything. My mom had a warm smile and a welcoming spirit, and I will truly miss, miss that. It will forever, I will forever be grateful that God chose her to be our mom. Thank you, Mom, for all the lessons you've taught all of us and for the love that you showed us. The Lord called you home. Take your rest, Mom. It's well earned. You have been a good and faithful servant. Now you are reunited with Dad together again. Until we meet again, Mom, you will forever be in our hearts. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. 
I'm, uh, I'm Roger, a third born son of Howard and Margaret. Um, I prepared, you know, some talking points, but before I, before I do that, I, I do want to take a moment just to thank some people on behalf of my brothers and my sister. Um, you know, we have, mom hasn't sat in a, a, a pew in Antioch over 13 years. Um, it's been a long time, but when we called, uh, and told her what was going on with mom, I'm told Antioch what was going on with mom, uh, it was how can we serve you? And, and they have been gracious and they've been open arms to us uh, in, through this time and we just thank you. We thank you for that. Um, many of you know that my mother had a stroke in 2010 and was in a, a nursing facility for, for since that time. There are so many of you who came to visit. Um, thank you, you know, mom, mom appreciates that. I know she appreciates that, and, and we as a family appreciate that. Um, there's so many cards and notes that people sent um, that they didn't have to. Um, I have to, I don't even know if they're here, Steve and Betty Miles. Um, I don't know if they're here. If they're not here, if somebody could get a word to them. Um, they were so consistent. They sent so many cards and so many notes, and I want them to know that uh, every one of them was read to my mother, and they encouraged her, and they encouraged us. Um, they, they, it was, you know, I, Truly, it was inspiring. Um, I want to thank, you know, as people have kind of alluded to, um, you know, mom couldn't speak, um, you know, couldn't have a really conversation with her, but if you started singing a song that she knew, like if you started singing Happy Birthday, she'd start singing along with you. And it was something that she knew it was in her, in her, in her being, it would come out. So when she, start, when she could sing hymns, she knew her hymns and she would sing hymns. And I'd, li I'd like to thank my, my mother-in-law, Christina Foster, she would go every week uh, and sing hymns with my mother. And I just want to say as a family, we thank you for that. And lastly, I just want to thank my wife. Um, you know, she not only did her hair, she was her stylist uh, in the nursing facility. Um, but my mom couldn't, she could only use one side of her body. And my wife went and researched the internet and found a a chair that you could power by one one arm and gave my mom a little mobility around the facility and you know those are the kind of things she did and you know whenever one of us couldn't be there she was there or she was there with us so I just want to you know I have to acknowledge um, you know my wife and how much we appreciate her through this thing through, through the time uh, since my mother's stroke and always and before um, I want to now take a couple minutes just to tell, talk about my mother um, which is why what I was really here to do. Um, you know, in your programs, you know, I, I want to highlight a couple of things. In, in, in the programs, um, it's mentioned that mom went right out, right out of Dunbar High School. She went to the teacher's college uh, for a short time. What's not in the, in the program is that she was one of the first uh, students to integrate that school. Um, she didn't tell us a lot about what happened. She described it as a nightmare. I mean, so I don't even know what she went through. Um, but um, 20 years later, um, with four children, not online, on a typewriter, going, you know, drop, dropping us off, uh, you know, getting us to the bus, we would come home, me and Dana, the only, only, only change I really remember was me and Dana had a babysitter, uh, Mrs. McCovey, that we used to, you know, go to after school. We, instead of going this way, we went that way, and this woman would watch us, uh, you know, with her family for a, for a few hours. While, and then mom would come and pick us up, and dinner would be dinner. I, I don't remember ever mom like mom can't do this because she's tired. Mom can't do this because she's studying. I don't remember missing anything because she was back at school. Um, you know, so it was just a, a a testament to you know who she was, and you know, going back to Towson was purposeful. I mean, that was a place that, 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 you know, was cruel to her. I, you know, I, I don't know what happened, but she wasn't going to be defeated, you know, and she went back and she got her degree and she taught for 20 years, first and second grade. But, you know, as people say, you know, mom, that wasn't enough for mom. She went back and got a master's and she was a, a vice principal. Um, you know, that's just the kind of thing. She was always trying new things and, you know, ended up at a, at a, in a basketball league for people over 70. It was, it was amazing. You know, I, I was getting calls. She would, she would ask low tops, high tops, 
you know, she talked about the games. I mean, literally, I went to go, I know Kenny went to go see uh, her play. I'm telling you, it was something. Fast break. <laughs> there wasn't anything fast going on there. But I tell you, the competitive nature was there. I mean, and mom loved to compete. It was, you know, the first time she'd really been on a team for her, you know, on her, you know, for herself. And she took full advantage and she loved it. She didn't like, she didn't like people sweating on her, but she liked to compete. She liked to compete. So my mom was determined. You know, she was hardworking. She was disciplined. She was tough. You know, there wasn't like things, there was no crying. That was not the way to get what you wanted. And, you know, LaRonda said this word to me, uh, you know, a couple days ago. She said, you know, your mom was fierce. I'm like, yeah, she, she was fierce. And that's what she was. And, and, and beyond all of that, she was smart. I mean, my mom was, I mean, she was smart. Um, another thing about my mother I want to highlight is that, you know, people mention this as well. She loved to entertain. And if anybody here had ever been to one of the functions that she, she hosted at our events, you know how, how good the food was and how everything was just the way she wanted it. Let me tell you a little bit about behind the scenes. <laughs> we were the workers. <laughs> right. And one thing, I, I love my mother, but, you know, she was a little bit of a control freak, and she wanted things the way she wanted them. And if you know, you, you know, if you're doing this, you're like, well, mom, why do I have to put the napkins, or why can't I use these napkins in it? She just like, don't start with me. <laughs> that'd be that'd be that'd be the first level, you know. And that if you kept going, you know, and for some reason kept like not doing exactly what she wanted to do, you know, in, in the order she wanted it, she'd look and say, y'all about to make me hot. That was full stop. Breaks. You just did exactly what you were supposed to do. But she will wear you out, man. I mean, mom will wear you out getting ready for something. But then you, you watch her orchestrate, you know, three different dishes, three different main dishes, all these sides and the punch bowl and everything was just where she wanted it. And exact, she had this vision for every event she ever had. And the amazing thing about it is I can remember, I think about how we, me and my wife, like we're always running at the last minute and somebody's upstairs getting ready. And, but she would run upstairs, she'd come back down and she'd be always ready for the first person to arrive. And everything was just, I don't know how she did it. It was truly amazing. Um, but she, she truly loved uh, of doing that. Um, another thing, you know, when I was in my late 20s, um, is when mom and dad went back to church. You know, they, they had grown up in the church, but they went away for a long time and, and they went back and it was like a complete change. You know, you think you know your parents, um, but they talk differently. They went to different places. The people they went with were different. And I couldn't find a beer in the house. I mean, it was, it was a problem, you know? And for, <laughs> And for a while, for a while, I was like, you know, I don't, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't necessarily on board, you know, because I, I, it was just like, where did my parents go? You know, I, I thought I knew them. But really, as time went on, what you really notice is that I, I had never seen my parents in more lockstep and unified around some, one thing than, than serving God and being at Antioch Baptist Church. They spent more time together. They were, they were at peace and they were happier than I've ever seen them, you know. So I, I truly thank God for their, them going back to church and them finding Antioch uh, to, 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 to serve. Um, our mother loved family and our, and our children and her children. Um, you know, some of the happiest times in my life are, were spent when we were together as a family. One, one thing I'll, I'll bring, I don't know if you guys even, if my brothers and sister remember this is, and when we lived at Honeysuckle in Maryland, uh, the power used to go out sometimes. And in dad's office, dad would sit in a chair and all of us would lay on, we'd be on the floor, you know, just laying around and we'd, and we'd play games in the, in the dark. Mom had candles and everything. And we'd play this game called Bird, Beast, or Fish. <laughs> and you had the name Bird, Beast, and somebody had to name one of the, a Bird, Beast, or Fish, you know, and you couldn't re use them over again. You know, but honestly, I, I, I bring it up only just because I, that's one of those times in my life I can truly remember just being happy. 
I was so happy just to be there, and we were all together. Uh, and it was, it was just nice, and one of those things that, you know, that mom made happen. You know, it was, that was playing games was her thing. And we played a lot of games, you know. As, you know, we played Monopoly. We played Risk. We played Scrabble. And everything was competitive. I mean, everything was competitive. And basically what these games broke down, this is what they basically happened, was Kenny and Greg tried to manipulate Dana and me to their benefit, you know, by making promises of, you know, like on risk. If you, if you attack Greg there, I will not attack you here. And then breaking every treaty. <laughs> But it was, and mom would sit there and watch and just sit there like, you know, and then win and just beat us. <laughs> we had all this stuff, but there was, there was laughing and there was a lot of crying. I'm telling you, there was no tears because mom did not play tears. You know, if, like I said, if you wanted something, do not cry. That was not the way to get something. But she loved us. You know, she poured all of herself and all the things that she was into us. You know, determination and hard, hard working, her fierceness, you know, the love of entertaining, you know, and, and the love of God. You know, mom was the example for us. And I'm just, you know, I know I speak for my brothers and my sister when I say, you know, how thankful. I'm thankful. I mean, I, you know, I, I know we're grieving and we're sad, but I, I tell you, I am thankful for my mom and the person she was and just you know, I can just, all I do is say thank you. And the last thing that I'll mention is that she loved Howard Boone. That was her husband of 52 years. And that was the most important thing to, well, obviously, second most important thing. But she loved her husband. And, you know, after my father passed in 2009, my mother was grieving. And during that grief, she, she wrote a letter to, to my father. Um, and I'd, I'd like to just read a part of that in closing, just to kind of give you a sense of, you know, their relationship. I will think of you as I look at the sky, as we often did from your favorite place, the window at the top of the back stairs in our house. We watched the beautiful sunsets in Florida and thought there could be nothing so, else so glorious. We walked the beaches in many places and marveled at the vastness of the ocean. You followed me through countless antique shops until you gave in and finally became fascinated with old books. We wandered through quaint shops and unique, unique boutiques, and I can't say you ever were happy about that. We enjoyed New York, Baltimore, and Washington theaters and eating out with friends. We looked forward to gospel concerts. Cruises were our favorite vacation. You especially enjoyed the times we opened our home and families through the years in the form of parties, fellowships, cookouts, brunches, dinners, and lunches. You made the best homemade ice cream. We were both blessed to have the gift of hospitality. You provided for me always, and I have never wanted for anything. I will miss you and the life we shared, but I know this is not goodbye, but only so long for a while. I love you, my poo, the love of my life, my husband, your loving wife, Margaret. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Gary Brooks. I'm Margaret's youngest brother. Um, I've been in a setting like this just a few months ago. Our brother, Will, passed away, and I had the opportunities to say a few words on Will. You heard all the great things about Margaret, and they're all true. I just want to reflect on a few things that some of you may not know, some of the kids may not know. My admiration and love for Margaret started when I was less than three years old. I was used to being with her before my nephew Kenny was born. And I tried to get in her lap. Kenny was in the lap. <laughs> and at less than three years old, I popped Kenny upside the head. That's why he's so smart. I gave him I elevated that brain and maturation of that brain. So, when I was 14 years old, 
and this was right after the riots in Baltimore and a lot of the urban cities. Margaret recognized that we need to get away. So she took me and my mother, she got a plane, we, first time we've been on a plane, probably my parents first, my mother's, our mother's first time outside of either North Carolina, Virginia, or Maryland. And we went out to the state of Washington. Went to Mount Rainier, Seattle, Spokane, Portland, Vancouver, Canada, Victoria, Canada. Went on a ferry. First time, all these things was new to this 14, 15 year old kid. Um, and my mother enjoyed as well. But she knew we need to get away. Now, our mom only had a seventh grade education. But she did a couple of things. That, that impacted on me, I'm sure it impacted on bra and it impacted on Margaret. When I was 13 years old, in the eighth grade, I'm going to the dining room table to do my homework. At that time, the dining room table was where a lot of things were done and discussed. Our mom said, hold up a minute. Our mom had completed seventh grade and she came out and had her eighth grade books. She had went back to school to Dunbar Night School, which is where Howard and Margaret met. And um, it was just, so something like that impacts you. But Margaret was tough. I mean, I was a br little brother, and, uh, but she and the kids allowed me to attend a lot of events with them, going all over the country, I, and they, after they graduated from getting bachelors and masters and coaching and, and playing football in college and also professional football, um, I had the opportunity to participate in all those things. Uh, but she'll push you. And one of the things she pushed me on was that in between relationships, I got my lovely wife here for 25 years current with me and my, my sons, and uh, I went back to the house at Linwood after, uh, after the first relationship ended. And Margaret saw me getting a little bit too comfortable at Linwood. I was sending her and brother this, this little rent check, you know, for Linwood. The house was, pay, the house was paid for. And Margaret kindly told me, say, you're getting a little too comfortable and we want our money. <laughs> so it made me, I worked on my credit score because in between marriages sometimes the credit score dropped a little bit. So it made me work on that and I got a mortgage to pay bruh in and Margaret out, give them their share. And I kept my, the one third, I just stayed in the house. But she did that because she knew that was best for me. And so it really pushed me, uh, learned more about real estate, even though I brought a house with the first marriage um, on that. And another thing she pushed me on is just education, the importance of education. And she did that through her own kids. So I would follow them and visit all these wonderful schools and, and states that they would go to. And I appreciate the kids my nephews and my niece for allowing me to follow them. Where they went somewhere, where it was in Florida, I went to Florida. If they went to, and Dana was the one I followed the most, I guess, uh, outside the state, the other um, um, nephew and niece, other nephews were more local, um, at least along the coast. But Dana got a chance to go to Cotton Bowl, sports fan like your mom. Uh, Dana was, uh, at the University of Oklahoma, assistant coach. Got a chance to go to Florida. She's the head track coach at Central Florida, University of Central Florida. And, and same way with all the other kids, whether it's William and Murray, graduation from law school for Kenny, Hampton uh, Institute at that time, now Hampton University. Duke, went to Duke. Uh, and um, Durham, North Carolina, following um, Greg and, and also um, Roger. And just when they moved to different places, I also went as well. 
So we, we're going to miss, I call the sister mom too. I heard that earlier in church when I sent a text to um, Roger and Kenny. And she was a sister mom. And I guess I'm going to make up a name for myself. Brother uncle. Yeah. <laughs> I spent so much time with my nephew and niece um, because of my sister and the love for her. So thank you very much. This time we're going to ask those who have not had an opportunity to read the obituary to take time to read over that now as we're preparing for a musical selection from our choir. Then Reverend Dr. Melvin Jones will lead us in our eulogy. Followed by that, we'll have our benediction recessional where we can receive the family in our ministry center multi-purpose room. So take a moment or two to read over the obituary silently. And once we felt that all of you have had time to adequately read it, our choir will render their final selection on today. Praise the Lord. We serve an awesome God. Hallelujah. Let's give him some praise. Our God is awesome. Our God is awesome. He can move mountains. He
Halleluja. Amen. Let's give this choir a hand praise this morning. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Amen. I also want to take a moment as you heard Deacon and Deaconess Boone, where Deacon and Deaconess is here, one of our members of our Deacon Board to stand up and be recognized if you're here this morning. Please stand up. <laughs> Amen. Let us pray. God, we thank you, Lord, for this day. God, we thank you, Lord, for the life of Deaconess Margaret Boone. Thank you, Lord, for the years that she served so faithfully here beside her husband, Howard, Lord. Thank you, Lord, God, for how she poured into this person, but many other people in this church. God, I thank you, Lord, for her life, Lord. I thank you, Lord, God, for her family, Lord. And I pray, God, that you would comfort them during this season of bereavement, God. And may you Lord bless these words this day. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Again, we're here today to celebrate the life of Deaconess Margaret Boone, known affectionately to me as Deaconess Boone. To Kenny, Roger, Gregory, and Dana, we pray for you during this time of bereavement. Thank you for allowing us to minister to you and to serve you during this season. And thank you for making the choice to bring your mother back home for this service today. God bless you. God bless you. Remember, earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. And knowing that your mom is now in heaven, reunited with your father, brings us peace. I can imagine the smile on his face when he saw her enter the pearly gates. Margaret, you're here. I can imagine that. He was an incredible man. They were an incredible couple. Amen. But she's rejoiced in heaven, not only with her husband, with her forebears, but also with her Savior, with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To the grands and the great-grands, remember that your grandmother loved you. And the love she had compelled you, compelled you to instill in your children the love and the sense of family, of knowing the traditions that she has, that she instills in you. And maybe you will continue the tea at three to instill those manners into your children. Amen. God bless you. The race metaphor is often used by the Apostle Paul in many of his writings. And for me, as I look at the life of Deaconess Boone, I remember... I, can affectionately remember her as running the race of life and being victorious. Will you stand with me to read our scripture verses this morning that come from Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14? And it reads as follows. Not that I've already attained, obtained all of this or I'm ready or I'm, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. If I had to put a tagline, if we will, on this message this morning, I would call it finishing well. In his letters, Paul uses many illustrations from the world to communicate, to communicate truth about the Christian life. A few of those, four of those are prominent. The military, when Paul says to put on, put on the full armor of God. Architecture reminds us that you are the temple of God. Agriculture, when he says, whatever a man sows, sows, that shall he also reap. And athletics is in this passage where Paul is talking about the life of an athlete. Now, the exact sport Paul is describing, whether it was a foot race or a chariot race, is not known. For the illustration purposes this morning, let's say it's a chariot race that Paul is talking about. Now, the Greek chariot used in the Olympic Games and other events, and it was a blessing, if I may, when we went to Greece in October to see where the original Olympic Games were held. It was really incredible to see that. But this what the Greeks used in the Olympic Games and other events was really only a small platform with a wheel on each side, and which caused the driver to have to hold on as he navigated the race. 
He had to lean forward and strain every nerve and muscle to just maintain balance and to control the horses as he ran this race. But when you think about it, isn't that a lot like our lives? We strive and press on to do our best to maintain balance on a small platform of time. And sometimes we can't forget that death is part of life. And it's not bad. Death is not a bad thing. But I submit to you that I believe that Deaconess Boone did this well. She ran the race of life well. She was a consummate army wife who loved God and put her children and her family first. If you look at verse 12 again, he says, I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. When Paul says, make it my own, he is talking about his newfound love for Christ after his conversion. Remember Paul's conversion on Damascus Road, where Paul's life before Christ, he spent persecuting Christians. After, after his encounter with Christ on the Damascus Road, he began proclaiming Jesus and reaching others for Jesus Christ. That was a conversion that took place on the Damascus Road. But yet, Paul shows his love for Christ that, that controlled him. He wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 12 through 15, we are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For, we are, for if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us. Some verses say the love of Christ compels us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who, might, who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Amen. Deaconess Boone accepted Christ at a young age. And I believe that it was her love for Christ that controlled and that compelled her to do many things that she did in life. Her love for Jesus was a foundation on which she built her life. And her compassion and love for others is one area that her love for Christ could be seen in her actions and her service to others. In January of 2004, my wife and I joined this church, Antioch Baptist Church, as a young married couple. We've been married for just a couple of months, and we joined this local church called Antioch. We were a couple who was very wet behind the ears. Antioch then and now has developed a system called the care group structure, which we use to connect our members to one another. Kim and I were initially assigned to the Philippi Circle that was then coordinated and led by Deacon and Deaconess Jesse and Faye Watson. But yet as the church began to grow, the care groups were subdivided into smaller care groups or other care groups as the church began to grow. And we were assigned to this new care group called the Galilee Circle. Amen, Galilee. Once in Galilee, you're always in Galilee. You never leave Galilee. We're led by Deacon and Deaconess Boone. And this was our first encounter with the Boones. And we found them to be an incredibly awesome couple who had a heart for God first, but also had a heart for young couples. They poured themselves into me and Kim, and they were simply like surrogate parents for us. They instilled quite a few nuggets into our lives, especially when our children were young. Now, some of those nuggets, I must admit, were tough nuggets. But Deaconess Boone always had a way of, that may have been, may have been a tough nugget, but she seasoned those nuggets with salt. <laughs> Every time. She, but she would tell you like it is. She would not mince words. I remember one time, um, Kim was sharing about one of our children, and somehow she said, shared with Deacon Spoon, this one child of ours wants to come into our room in the middle of the night and sleep in our room. Deacon Spoon said, you got to stop that. That's, your, that's you and your husband's marital bedroom. She is not to get in there. Here's what you are to do. On a Saturday night, you are to meet that child in the middle of the hallway, escort them back to their room and they will get used to sleeping in their room. But Kim said, but I'll be tired. She goes, that's okay, you'll get over it. <laughs> Escort the child back, and it worked, it worked. 
I remember another occasion when we were having some issues with one of the children in their education. And Kim went to Deaconess Moon. And she said, how am I going to get this child into college? Deaconess Moon said, now stop right there. Just stop right there. The child is in what, first grade? <laughs> You're putting the child in college already? Just get the child out of grade school. <laughs> so she put it plain. Those nuggets were seasoned with salt. And I thank God for her. I really do. It was the love of Christ that I believe controlled many things that Deaconess Boone did. And she instilled manners in her children again by having tea at three. But in verse 13, Paul says that he is still striving, still trying to progress and move ahead. But in part B of verse 13, he says this, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. The chariot racer could not be successful by continuing to look over his shoulder at the past. And Deaconess Boone did not want us looking over our shoulder at the past. She wanted our eyes fixed straight ahead to reach the glory that God has for us. Deaconess Boone focused on what was ahead of her. She lived a very focused life. She was a pioneer and a visionary. She was a constant teacher even after she retired. She was a spiritual leader. Every Friday, she would send out Friday encouragement emails to Galilee Circle. Every single Friday, she did that. She had a sense of humor. She was humble. I remember when she and Deaconess Boone, I think they were one of the first in the congregation when they started coming out, when the cars were coming out with those key fobs where you didn't have to take the key out of your pocket to open the door. And she asked me to come out to her car to get something. I forgot what it was. But she walked out and said, well, Deacon Spoon, where's the key? And she humbly said, I don't need a key. It's in my pocketbook. And she reaches to the door. She goes, see, the door opens when I touch it. And she was just so humble the way she did it. It was, just, it was really cool. It was right there in the park. It was really it's like, this woman's got it going on. But she was a lifelong learner. She was also in the inaugural, inaugural cl graduating class of the Antioch Bible Institute. She was a lover of God's word. She wanted to grow deeper and deeper in God's word. She was active in the women's ministry and taught small group classes. And as her son said, she even played in a basketball league for seniors over 70 years old. She was a baller. <laughs> My goodness. And her gift of hospitality. Deaconess Boone could enter entertain from the smallest gathering to the largest. I used to love getting those emails saying, okay, Galilee Circle, we're having a fellowship at our house. Man, you, you didn't eat for days. Because you know Deaconess Boone had it going on. In fact, she and Deacon Boone, to the best of my recollection, pioneered the concept in this church of church tailgates. And if they did exist before they did it, Deacon and Deacon's Boone took it to a new level. And that's what made it special, the, the Boone tailgate party for Galilee Circle. Yes, my friends, Galilee had and Galilee still has it going on in this church. Amen. I'm not trying to start a circle war. I'm just telling you all like it is. Galilee got it going on. But yes, Deacon Deaconess Boone ran this race well. In verse 14, Paul writes, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. Now at the end of the race, after each event, they, held a, they had a herald announce the name of the victor, the victor's father's name in his country, and the athlete or the charioteer would come and receive a palm branch in their hands. Scholars propose that this upward calling could refer to the summons to the winner to approach the elevated stand of the judge and receive his prize at the end of the race. And this is the call to which Paul is now alluding. For Paul, his prize was found in Christ and to know Christ fully and completely. See, Paul knew where he had come from. Paul knew what God had done in his life. And Paul wanted to make sure that Jesus was proclaimed wherever he went. Deaconess Boone knew where she had come from. Deaconess Boone knew the change that God had made in her life. 
And Deaconess Boone wanted to make sure that those around her, anyone that came into encounter with her, knew who Jesus was. You did not leave Deaconess Boone's presence without knowing you had been in the presence of someone who knew Jesus Christ. And she would tell you that in case you didn't know. And she would want to make sure you knew Jesus Christ. And I share with you this morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, don't leave the grounds of this campus without approaching one of us and saying, I want to know the Jesus that Deaconess Boone knew. Amen. And see, at the end, Paul wanted the righteous judge, the holy judge, Jesus, to tell him, come up and receive the prize. Now, the Good News Bible translates this verse saying, I run straight towards the goal in order to win the prize. See, Deaconess Boone had her gaze fixed on the finish line. She knew her end was near. She knew she had poured herself into her family. And on Wednesday morning, February 28th, God said, Deaconess Boone, come up here. You've run a good race. You finished the race. You have finished it well. And she crossed the finish line. Yes, Deaconess Boone, you finished the race and you ran it well. And God bless you. I thank, I thank God that I, that I knew you, that you loved on me and my family, and you loved on your family. She's loved, she's touched so many lives in this place today. And as we prepare to close the celebration on the, on the, of the life of Deaconess Boone, I'm just thankful to God for the model that she was to me to my family and for this church. And again, to those under the sound of my voice, if you don't know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, accept him today. God loves you. Let us pray. God, again, we thank you, Lord, for this day, and thank you, God, for the life of Deaconess Boone. Thank you, Lord God, for the lives that she touched, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the life that she lived. Not a perfect life, but a life that was forgiven, a life that confessed Jesus as her Lord and Savior, a life that she used to spread the gospel across the world on various mission trips, and even in this local church, Lord. The many people that came across her in Galilee Circle, the many people that came across her here in this church, God, how she poured into others through the studying of your word to better equip herself to share the light and love of Jesus Christ with the lost and dying world. God, a model that I will never forget, just her name, just her presence, just her smile, God. And just now that she's reunited with you in heaven, God, she's smiling. She's rejoicing. She couldn't communicate on this side after a stroke, Lord, but she's praising you now, openly, saying, God, I love you. I'm so happy to be home. And God, we long to one day see her again because we know you and we love you. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Turn the service over to the funeral home at this time.